Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We're just allowing you all in. I'm delighted to say we have over 150 people registered today. So we're just giving it a few minutes to allow everyone to arrive. Welcome to you all, logging in, no doubt, from everywhere around Europe, uh, but particularly the UK. So we can see the participants arriving. Uh, everything is going smoothly. Our IT is uh, working correctly, which is wonderful. And uh, we'll just give it one more minute uh, before I begin. I'll just repeat myself. Welcome everybody to the webinar. It's a great pleasure to see you all here this morning on uh, this sunny day here in central London and annoyingly extremely sunny and warm in Madeira, <laughs> where both my guests are speaking from today. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that we will now begin the webinar. It's a pleasure to see you all. We are uh, welcome and good morning to everybody. We now are officially being recorded and we're transmitting live on Facebook and other social media. Welcome to our participants. Welcome today to our webinar. It's uh, the 6th of October, 2022. It's 11 a.m. here in central London. And we are here today from the Moving to Portugal events to host our webinar, What Factors Should You Consider for a Successful Relocation to Portugal? Now, I'm delighted that we have uh, hundreds, well, dozens, nearly 100 visitors uh, watching today. My name is Christina Hipsley. I'm the general manager of the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce here in the UK. And as many of you know, we run these events called Moving to Portugal in the UK throughout the year, a mixture of live events and webinars. And today is another of our webinars. They're all on our movingtoportugal.org.uk website, and you can watch them at any time in the future. So now the reason all of you are here with us today is I think because you are thinking of relocating to a sunny, even compelling place, hopefully Portugal, otherwise that's, uh, you wouldn't be with us today. And uh, specifically today, we can talk in some depth about Madeira because our two experts who are joining me today, both live and work in Madeira, but whatever we discuss today also applies to mainland Portugal. Now, what should you consider when you're preparing for your new life in Portugal? And um, how can you find a new home? And we're going to talk about the issues surrounding that. So if I could have the introductory slide, please. Now, as I said, I'm the general manager and my guests today at the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce are John Mather, who's the CEO of uh, Emigre EU based in Madeira, and also Tanya Castro, who's the general manager of TPMC, again headquartered in uh, Madeira, and both of uh, my guests have years of expertise in helping British people and other nationalities move their lives, their businesses, their families to Portugal, whether purely for uh, a, a second life or a retirement or, or to move your family there full time, or whether you might just be considering Portugal as a European gateway or a European foothold for you now that we're out of Europe. So um, firstly, we're going to talk to John and then Tanya, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box uh, at the uh, bottom of the screen. And we will, uh, I will ask our, uh, ask our um, guess the questions. We aim that this webinar will be no more than 45 minutes, so I think we'll start now. So if I could have the next slide, please, and I'm going to introduce our first guest, John Mayer. John, now here is your contact details and a short biography about yourself. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Emigre and what you're doing, what sort of clients you've got? Um, well, I think if, if you just go back and have a look at the um, the purpose of my last business in wealth management, that was to enhance the well-being of those that I touched. I mean, that was the overarching objective. Um, and in giving these talks over the last, it's, you know, it's eight and a half years now, Christina, mm, I, um, I realised that um, the purpose has actually not changed. And we're still delivering um, 
improvements in wellness, in well-being, uh, but different, delivered in a slightly different way, using some of the skills that were acquired over 50 years in wealth management. Um, I had a bias, as you know, towards property in, um, in that regime. And there are at least two areas that make a significant difference to the, to the acquisition of property uh, and the well-being of people moving. That's the, that's the way in which the property is set up and also the way in which they have correctly set up as a new guest in a new country. And hopefully eventually after five years or so to become a full citizen. And that's why you need competent skilled and uh, experienced managers such as as, as we've done, uh, invited today with uh, Natalia. And I should add that you have direct experience yourself. You've moved yourself to Portugal, haven't you? Very, in the last I, I, bought, I bought in, in June of 2016. I realised that the Portuguese process is quite different in legal terms from anything I've been used to in the United Kingdom. Um, and it was essential, therefore, to find the competent advisors because I've seen lots of people try to make a Portuguese acquisition using British law, and of course they finish up in a mess. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. Um, so if you look at three, um, if we take turns to the next slide, um, my retirement lasted a very short time, um, <laughs> and um, we now have a team, and that that started um, in the strangest of ways. Um, because I helped somebody who came to one of these sessions on a totally pro bono basis because I could see himself getting into trouble on what he was doing. Um, and he made some favorable comments published in the Sunday Times and put my name in there and the contact details. And suddenly we have inquiries and now we have an office and, and two very capable members of staff to help, both Mark and, uh, uh, and, and Jesse, who now work with us. Um, so if we go to the next slide. And just to be um, clear, you're based in Madeira, but uh, your advice holds good for the rest of Portugal. But uh, you have based yourself in Madeira for ostensibly your retirement. But you have your retirement, as you say, lasted about five months. And then you have set up this new business advising uh, people who wish to move. Well, it, yes, it, making sure that we hold our hands through that moving process and that they they do get on board the right people to help them both legally and fiscally, mm. because there are some very simple errors they can make, uh, which will cost them dearly further down the track. So we're, we're making sure that those mistakes don't happen. Um, so, yes, and, and, and the Sunday Times was, made some very favourable comments there. We've now got representation in the UK with 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 Mark. Penny, who's joined us recently, so that we can cover the mainland as well now, and we'll develop that over the next year. But Madeira is very popular at the moment because that has the retained the golden visa status on on properties to live in, and yeah, which we, we'll come to. Mm. Which that's that's I'm not going to stray into Tanya's uh, time and, and and work on this, but you you know that a lot of the mainland no longer qualifies. Um, so really, what we're saying is that. Um, Let's have a look at some of the common mistakes that are made. In my career in wealth management, I knew that people often, more often than not, underestimated how long they're going to live. So if you just look at the facts, let's take the, the sample of these people are 65, there's a male, there's a female, there's a couple. There's a 50% probability that they will get to age 85, 88, and 92, and a 25% probability that they will do even better and get to 92, 94 and 97. Now with the climate here and the healthy living style, that even could be exceeded. So whatever you, you're thinking about, these people are thinking about a 30 year plus time horizon for the, the time beyond their current work. So we need to bear that in mind. This is not a short term thing. And for, for many people, they're going to spend more, more time in in this so-called retirement than they did in, in work itself. Why do they choose to come to Portugal? Well, the survey recently um, listed the popularity of various reasons, and I won't bore you with listing them, people have already made their minds up. The important thing here, the first important thing, is it's different for all people. Everybody has that mix differently, and we've got to listen to why they're, they're coming here. What is their objective? What are their family commitments? 
what are they trying to achieve? One thing that's happened, uh, we go on to the next slide, in the last few months, people have begin, begun to realize that actually, uh, one more click on the slide, please, that the new highest priority is the impact on discretionary spending and the cost of living. That is big. We've been batting on about this for some years, haven't we, Christina, about yeah, yeah. Pressure spending. But now that has come home to roost and that's the re current reality. So let's have a look at some some realities there. Um, yes, it's very important. We have health care, that we have affordable lifestyles, etc. But the the extra push is the shrinkage that you've got in discretionary income in the UK now. So let's have a look at the next slide. Um, these are really the, the main positive benefits that people move to Portugal. You know, the, and, and, and in particular now the health service, the concerns of the health service. We have a brilliant health service here um, and insurance is relatively cheap. Why would they move? Let's have a look at the next slide. Well, quite often the golden visa is one of the popular solutions. I know Tani would co cover other options as well. But what we're trying to do is to make sure that in the long term, we have an option beyond five years, we could actually have citizenship and be able to move anywhere within Europe without constraint or work in Europe. And so we do that by investing 500,000 euros. We can spend as little as 14 days in Portugal and ultimately we finish up with a second, a second passport. Um, so let's have a look at the next slide. The next area is just think about money. Broadly speaking, um, rents are 175% higher than in Madeira, in London. Restaurant prices over 100% higher than in Funchal. Um, we finish up with grocery prices nearly 70% greater in, in London. And overall, you finish up, seven, if you ignore rents, then it's over 70% of, the, of your fixed costs are higher in London. If you include rents, then in fact you finish up over a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand. So what's going to happen? Well, at the moment that's where we are in um, in England. But twenty three percent of somebody, this is an example of somebody on fifty thousand pounds a year. They only have discretion over about twenty three percent of their gross wages. The effect of moving to Portugal is that that discretionary spend goes up by 55% to 55%. So more than doubles. That's what makes life a lot more pleasant and a lot less stressful. Now you might say to me, well, surely you're governed by the same global problems that we have with energy as the rest of Europe has. Of course we do. We can't escape the price rises on oil and gas and the rest. Um, only today, the Saudis decided to drop the daily production of oil by 2 million barrels. That's put the price up already this morning. Where we differ is, for instance, our, I have a flat in, in the centre of Funchal, in a, modern, in a modern block. We have air conditioning. And in the last six years, I don't think we've turned it on five times. And for heating, we're probably a similar number of times over the last six years. So if you don't use gas, just electricity for cooking and heating water, then in fact, your costs aren't there in the first place. So we don't need subsidy. So that's quite a helpful um, situation. Next slide. Of course, you don't necessarily have to become resident. I mean, a number of people ask me what happens if if the golden visa disappears and we're planning to be there in three or four years time, not now. Well, there are a couple of options. You can apply for the golden visa straight away. You don't have to spend a lot of time here to, to qualify. Um, and if you don't fancy managing a physical property and all the worry that that brings with it, then in fact, you can go the fund route. There are some um, Portuguese government approved funds where you can diversify your property investment over 40, maybe 50 properties, high end quality stuff. And then after five years, you can decide where in Portugal you want to reside um, and use the proceeds of that maturing investment um, to, um, to, 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 to buy the property at that time. 
Um, now, I was a director of a hedge fund for 10 years, so I've been both sides of the, 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 the coin with, um, uh, with, with funds. So I know what, what to look for in, in a fund. So we've chosen funds that I would personally buy myself with my money. Uh, we'd have to be careful on these things. Um, for instance, one of the worries I have um, is buying an interest in a hotel room in a large complex. I mean, how are you going to liquidate that after five years? I mean, how do you sell one hotel room unless there is some robust buyback process that's already in place? The next slide, please. So the key, key ingredients when you're looking at the, the, the move, obviously location is, is something that's, that's personal, but it's very important to get it right. If you're going to look at buying off plan or buying into a fund that gets involved in, in joint ventures with developers, then let's have a look at the construction risk and the solvency risk of those parties involved. Let's, in, in, let's get rid of um, some of the sales risk. In our searching for property for clients, quite often we find properties not on the market, privately sold. That's where there's some mismatch of price and value that can advantage our clients. You know, we're charging 1% to do the, uh, the, the research and negotiation. And then we throw in the other benefits of introducing the right people and holding their hand through the process. I don't know anybody who can get the house purchase um, and, and moving right within 1%. And frankly, if we can't save them four to five times what we cost them, then we don't know what we're doing. So far, we've had um, no, um, no failures on that side at all. Okay. Obviously, we need clear exit strategies on funds, as I've said. Yeah. And, uh, we can talk about those on an individual basis. That's okay. subject to its own right. Next slide. So just to recap, John, uh, your service helps people relocating to Portugal, particularly to Madeira. For a fee of 1%, you will um, advise them on all aspects of their move, whether they're moving permanently or whether they're thinking about uh, simply getting a golden visa in Portugal for uh, uh, the, the, the ability to spend time in Europe. We'll come to the difference in a minute. And um, you will pass on to your clients the benefit of all your expertise and experience in terms of structuring their uh, financial requirements, thinking through their visa needs, thinking through the kind of property they need, or should they just invest in other um, compliant funds if, if necessary. So you are basically there to make any relocation from the UK to Portugal, specifically Madeira in this case, as easy as possible and as risk-free as possible using your financial expertise. Well, yeah, but yes, but not necessarily. Um, quite a lot of the clients that are, are, are getting organized to come have their own existing financial advisor in the UK. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm not going to just try to displace that relationship. That's not my role. I'm concentrating essentially on the problem. Well, what I can do, having had 50 years successful management of money in, in, in England, um, I can actually help their financial advisor, who's probably not aware of the Portuguese aspects, of the pitfalls to avoid. I mean, for instance, the way in which a bank account is opened, the way in which money needs to be sent. Mm. You know, we came across a, a situation where somebody last year um, came to me and said, how do I get out of this problem? I, I, I drew, withdrew money from my pension scheme, and now I'm being asked for a very large amount of tax in the UK. Well, basically, he didn't take the advice relevant to arri arriving in Portugal. So the revenue actually didn't actually admit that he'd left. So he did something which caused him a tax bill in the UK. Another one we came across came here and drew his tax-free cash out of his pension. That incurred a 10% tax charge for no good reason. Now, if he'd gone back to his original advisor and if we'd been able to have a useful dialogue with that advisor, we could have warned about these small points. Mm. Okay. Right. And that would have saved them tens of thousands of pounds. Right. It's, it's very important that we get these things right. It's the devil is always in the detail. Um, so, yes. And so I'm not straying into other people's financial. OK, I've got the, I've got the European qualifications and I could. But, you know, I'm 75 soon. 
you should not really be taking on a long term don't believe it <laughs> a long term financial advisor if you're if you're in your 60s you want somebody who's a bit younger than you not somebody who's going to fall off his perch before you. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry i forgot where i was now um, here you go right yeah and, um, so, so so i really they, they, there's we've got to challenge assumptions and habits that you've got you know you've, you've got to think as a new person here what is the best thing for you as and your family arrangements to make sure that the plan you have is totally bespoke and that you've got the backup of qualified professional team to help you out with this transition yeah okay brilliant um I think the other thing that I need to talk about to give you some positive sides of this, the, the real estate investment can actually boost your retirement. And I'll go into that in a moment. I think it's in the next slide. Yes, I should just say we're getting some very good questions into our chat and uh, Q&A box. Craig, particularly yours, please bear with us. Um, we'll come to the questions shortly, uh, but we just need to finish the slides. Yeah, so there's just this final slide, a bit of good news. Um, although the prices have gone up, in, 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 in Madeira, as you might expect, and in Portugal generally. Um, if in fact you are in one of the postcodes marked red, you will actually finish up, if you bought the same property here as you've got now in England, you would finish up with cash in the bank because that's where the prices are greater than here in, in, in England. Mm. So it might not work too well for Hull, but if you're in Kensington, where, where in fact, or in Maribyrn as well. rich, it's white, not even red. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the prices in North central London are absurd, even, even despite the sort of recent drops. Um, I mean, I know I, I sold in Wimpole Street at over 17,000 euros a square metre, and that was more than six years ago, and bought here for less than four. That frees up a lot of fun tickets to enjoy your, your, your retirement. So add that to the benefit of low, lower cost of living. Well, you start to get some peace of mind and some, uh, some flexibility in what you want to do with the rest of your life. So, and then just, I think the last thing is just the, the team. Um, I've persuaded Mark out of retirement. We need to, to be able to give people some service in the UK. And it's not very efficient for me to fly back to the UK often. OK, we, we can manage with these Zoom calls. It's been very good so far. Um, but um, we've got somebody now more on the spot. And Jessie is just a, a, a dream of a person to work with. She's very smart, obviously perfectly fluent in Portuguese, which I'm not yet. Um, so we have a small team, but we're having fun doing it. All the mighty. Excellent. Yeah. Well, so thank that's you, me. John. That's me. Thank you. thank you very much, John. Now, we're getting some really good questions. Richard, thank you for yours as well. We will come to the questions very shortly, but uh, I'd just now like to move on and introduce our second speaker, who's just going to give you some pointers. Uh, Tanya, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for coming. I should say uh, Tanya's also been a corporate member of the chamber for, God, six, seven years. I remember the day you walked into our office. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Tanya's been our eyes and ears in Madeira and our advisor on all aspects, financial and fiscal uh since then um we have uh, over 60 companies who are members of the chamber but tanya is a leading member and um tanya is now going to uh, next slide please carolina uh, tanya is now going to introduce herself yeah so and uh, or could you go to the intro slide please the previous one that's it right tanya yes welcome to the uh seminar and um Tanya's got 17 years experience. And Tanya, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, TPMC. So uh, I'm a Madeirian, so raised and born and raised in Madara. Uh, <laughs> Madara, as you all know, is an island in Portugal. So all the legal, fiscal and, and uh, civil regime applies also in Madara with several highlights and that's where usually uh, the clients ask our advice. As John said and very well, uh, we work in regional markets and even uh, with the excellent work that John does, searching the market, saying how it can be compatible with the UK regime, you will need also to, to check, analyze, and be aware of the Portuguese regime. So you know exactly what you need to do, the steps you need to make, 
um, the formalities and the bureaucracy that you need to achieve when you arrive to Madara. We work in the international market for the past 17 years. We were born from the need of the clients who, who arrived um, at our island and needed uh, a company or somebody that could guide them into all the formalities, all the legal duties, all the fiscal um, register they needed to do. Besides, and, and this is something I already saw in some questions you, you, you raised and that we will answer after the presentation. Besides the legal and the fiscal duties, we also have a team that can help you with the small details like the insurances, like reviewing all the papers you need if you buy a real estate, all the monthly commodities you need to have. So all the things you need um, to be aware in order for you to have peace and quiet and enjoy your time in Madara. Please let me just uh, tell you that um, we are a, a team of about 55 people. We work in several departments. We have a legal department, but also a fiscal and accounting one that can help you dealing with your investments, your personal taxes, if you do decide to come and reside fiscally in Nevada. Uh, but we also have an administrative team that can help you with all the small details of your daily routine. Um, this, this team is very well orientated for the needs of the foreigners that come and decide to live in Nevada. As John said, and John talked about the Golden Visa, uh, but we do have many other options. And um, please be aware that each client is a client, each situation is a situation. So if you don't need to get a residency visa, for example, but you want to spend one, two or three months in Madara in the house that you bought to enjoy the sun or to, 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 to spend the winter, uh, to leave a little bit the cold in the UK and come to the mild winter we have in Madara, you really don't need to have a residency visa, for example, because the tourism visa will allow you to stay a maximum of 90 days in Madara. And if you don't want a golden visa, but you do decide to reside in fact in Madara, we also have other solutions. In this presentation, I will speak a little bit about the Golden Visa and the D7, because according with our experience in the UK market, are the ones that the clients uh, ask about. But we also have other um, visas like the Entrepreneur Visa and the Digital Nomad Visa and many others that if you need information we are available to give you as uh, all our contact details are stated in the presentation also. Just for you to be aware that there are several options, that's why we always like to analyze each case and then um, define with you the best solution for your specific case here from the Portuguese side. So the first thing you need to be aware is that in order for you to buy any real estate, any capital share, any asset that needs a register, you need to have a Portuguese fiscal number. This number is directly asked here in the fiscal authorities, but as UK is not, no longer a EU member, you will need a fiscal representation unless you decide to come and reside fiscally in Madara. We also provide this kind of service and we will also disclose to you all the legal and, and uh, technical procedures you will need to uh, have in order to achieve the public deeds for a real estate, the acquisition of a financial investment, all that you need to be aware. Um, maybe we can start with the golden visa and then uh, we can develop from there. So can you please pass? Yes, okay. So as John said, in, in the, the beginning of this year, there were some changes in the Golden Visa. Namely, what they change is they, they um, 
they increase a little bit the amounts for some investments, namely for the deposit on a current account of a bank account and the investment on the companies. But they also change geographically the zones where in, where in Portugal you can achieve and have a golden visa for habitation. So Lisbon or Porto, the main, the, the high density areas in Portugal are no longer available for uh, the golden visa when related to habitation. This means that um, Madeira and Açores, which are the islands in Portugal, have increased a lot the, the level of importance besides the fact that we have an excellent climate. Today we have 23 degrees, it's sunny, our winter is very mild, so you will have a temperature between minimum of minimums 15. As John said, we, we don't use often the heater or the air conditioner. Um, another advantage is that um, the importance for the Golden Visa has increased because we are one of the main areas for that goal. Um, we will guide you, and I know this is something you ask, we will guide you in all the steps for the Golden Visa. Besides helping you liaising with the foreign services or the Portuguese embassy, we will gather with you all the documents. We will explain you which documents you need, including, I know that there's some question about the health insurance. We, we work with all the brokers, so we can also ask several budgets and, and ask um, the, the, the portfolio of the, the, the insurance, so you know exactly the options you have. Everything related with the public entities in Madara, being social security, fiscal authorities, we will also guide you with that. And we will follow with you step by step. Uh, besides that, um, there is there are some options on the commercial real estate and on the fund subscription, as John already said. Please note that in terms of greater than TV visas, the golden visa has a very highlight that separates from the other. It's the only visa that will allow you to have a residency card without the need to, in fact, live and be a fiscal resident in Madara. So it will give you the freedom to travel worldwide and within the space Schengen and EU, but there's no need to, in fact, live in Madara. So you, will, you can spend the, in the first year a minimum of 14 days and seven days on all the other years. Mm -hmm. All the other residency visas will have a mandatory of being a fiscal resident in Madara or in Portugal. This is applicable to the entire country. Another visa we um, have a lot of inquiries from UK is the D7. So, D7 is a, is a residency visa, so in this one, you will need to, in fact, live in Madara, but this one is very well orientated for uh, retired people or people that live from a stable income, a monthly stable income, like real estate income, intellectual property, financial investment, and the retired, of course. Um, this one will give you also the possibility, like in all the other visas, to have family reunification, which is a question that a lot of the clients ask us. So basically, and just to resume without very technical terms, one of the spouses asks the visa. So it can be um, the husband or the wife, the partner, you don't really need to be married as long as you have a, a, a document confirming that you are together for at least two years. Usually what they ask is a fiscal document, if you deliver your taxes together, if you have a council document that confirms that you live together. So one of the two will ask the visa. The documents are analyzed, and once the, the foreign services gives you the okay, they will ask you physically to do the biometrics. The biometrics are 
to see the color of your eyes, your hair, the fingertips. So all the physical details. At that stage, we can already ask the reunification of the rest of the family. The rest of the family does not need to do any kind of investment if you are talking about the golden visa, for example, because all of them allow the applicant to bring the family with them uh, also together. And the rest of the family will be and will have the same rights as the applicant. So the right to the health center, the right to live and reside, the, the, the right to have also a fiscal inscription. So everything regarding the residency. For this specific visa, there is a minimum amount that the foreign services will confirm if you receive. And this is why, because the government wants to confirm that you have the minimum amount considered to um, live and pay your monthly uh, bills um, in, in Madara. So it's 7,200 euros for the first adult, 3,600 for the, the other adult. And if you have children and you can bring them with you until the 24 years, so 24, if at that time we will need to stipulate that they are still studying, okay? If they are already working, it, it they are not considered as a dependent. Okay. Okay. If if um, if you have children, there's also an, an amount per year that we need to define that um, will be a monthly or annual um, income stable. At that time, and please note that while on the golden visa, you need to one one of the items is to acquire a real estate. On the D7, you can have a long-term rental agreement. Please note that it needs to be at least a one-year rental agreement. One of the items they will ask is the evidence of a fixed residency here in the island so they can establish for your residency uh, purposes that you have a fixed address. Um, the rental agreement can be done um, with any rental, with any real estate, as long as it's issued for application. And you need to demonstrate because also in Portugal, the rental agreements are registered. So they can easily confirm that is achievable. Um, for the other small aspects, we are here to guide you and to also inform you about all the, the documents and all the procedures. It seems complicated, and I know that you're thinking about that. Everything related to fiscal and bureaucracy is always uh, very complicated. But at the end, the, the basically, the only documents you need to uh, be aware that you need to confirm and ask in UK will be two. All the others are obtained within Portugal and with our assistance. So the only main documents you need to take care in the UK for any of the visas will be the, your fiscal number from the country of residency and your criminal record. All the other documents will be obtained in Portugal. So even though it seems a long list, if you ever ask one and we send you, please have this note because sometimes we get scared about the level of document and the bureaucracy, but at the end, that's why we are here to help you with that. Okay. Another thing very important when you think about moving to another country is the future. So um, I'm not retired yet. I want to keep on working, I want to develop my business, I'm a consultant, I want to have a local business, I want my children to have the possibility also to have something when they grow up. So what we do is, besides helping you with the residency and the formalities, we also help you with the fiscal side. If you decide to be a resident in Madara, in Portugal, we have the non-habitual regime, which is the regime that you can apply once you get the residency and will um, be 
um, in place for a 10 year window where you can get reduced individual taxes, which we all know that the main problem in all the developed countries and sub-developed countries is in, are the individual taxes. Uh, because usually the government lowers the corporate taxes to it, to it, to have and to to have more investment, but then the personal taxes are always very high. So with the non-habitual regime, you can have access to a ten percent fixed rate on your patient. Please note that once you come to Portugal and you decide to reside fiscally in Portugal you will be closing the fiscal records in UK and you will be passing from a resident in UK to a non-resident status in UK. So this is very important because this, um, sometimes we have clients that simply or forgotten or, and this, this usually happens with a lot of countries, not only uh, I'm saying UK because we are talking to UK, but this is common to other clients. Um, we need to make sure that once you get a, reg a fiscal register in, in Madara, you will close your fiscal records in UK. Otherwise, the two countries can have the possibility to tax you. And as John told you at the beginning, it's very important to coordinate with your fiscal advisors from UK, but also with people in Portugal that are aware of the advantages and disadvantages of the regime in Portugal, but also when we place the two of them together. So the rules from the UK side and the rules from the Portuguese side, so that when you decide to come or when you want to make a decision, you have the full information that you need to make the best decision possible for your case. This regime, the non-habitual resident, is also very, very interesting if you go ahead and start or continue to develop um, an activity. I, I have to tell you that I have several UK clients who still do a lot of consulting, who have companies, and we can reduce and fix a, a, a personal tax, which I can guarantee you will be a lot less than, than the normal that you are uh, paying in UK or the normal that you would pay in, in, in Portugal. This regime is specifically, and it was specifically uh, created for foreigners that come and live in Portugal. So one of the basic uh, of the regime is that you cannot uh, be considered as a resident on the prior five years or have any kind of income on, on the prior five years because this is in fact a, a system that um, allows to attract residents to Portugal. This is applicable to, to Portugal as a country. Another thing you need to think about is your kids, your family, your wife, your husband. So there's no wealth tax but there's also no heritage tax in Portugal. If we are talking about ascendants and descendants, so fathers to sons, grandfathers to grandchild, uh, daughters or sons, um, as long as we are talking about a straight line, there's no heritage tax, which is very important for family planning. And I do know that several clients also ask about that. So our job is, together with John, of course, and with your consultants in UK, is to analyze your case, see the residency profile, but also see the full picture. So what will happen in five years? What will happen in 10 years? What will happen if your kids come also, if they don't come? What will happen with your asset? If you ever sell one, what will be your taxation? Um, all the advantages and disadvantages, disadvantages of each regime. Uh, and with that, I'll leave you with my contacts. Uh, we are at your disposal. Um, and please note that sometimes we read a lot on the internet and on the web. And I think it's, it's, it's one of the good things we have today is that if we have some question, we can go and Google it, 
and um, we will be aware and th there are a lot of information but please note that the information that we find on, on Google sometimes is not updated or is not the one specific for your case so uh, we always uh, ask the clients to confirm with an expert um, because this will, as John already told you, allow you to save a lot of money um, today and in the future. Thank okay. you so much for watching. Thanks, Tanya. Right. Thank you so much to both John and Tanya. Now, we have had some excellent questions from our audience. Thank you for your patience, audience. I just didn't want to interrupt Tanya and John in the middle of their slides because some of the information you've been asking for would have been given already but um i'm going to ask uh i'm going to ask several of our great questions have come in i'm going to ask um tanya uh this particular question from one of our viewers uh who thanks us very much for the presentation thank you it's lovely to have you with us um right uh, this question is about the d7 visa tanya uh mm. This lady is saying, my partner and I are both UK citizens and want to apply for the D7 visa in Portugal as soon as possible. We are partners and have been together for many years, but we are unmarried. What documents are needed to prove <coughs> we are a couple so that one of us can qualify as a dependent adult? Yes. So that's an excellent question because it's something that is very usual today. And what, what um, the law states, and according with our experience, there are two ways for you to demonstrate that. Or you and your partner annually, you deliver your taxes together to your fiscal authorities, and that's proven enough. We need the last two years, because the law states that we can prove a union as long as they are together in the same address, for the last two years so all you send us the confirmation for the last two years of your two taxes came together or you ask your council your city um, council to issue a, a statement which is also very usual we, we already received from several clients from uk confirming that both of you live at that address for the past two years okay that's interesting these are the most common that usually we 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 use in UK. Okay, uh, similar to that, Tanya. I think it's probably the same lady asking. Uh, with family reuni reunification, as long as children are dependents at the start of the program, does it does it matter if they are no longer dependents at the end of the five years? We're talking about the golden visa yeah. here. Yeah. When you want to apply for citizenship? Yeah. So. Any visa, including the Golden Visa, will have a two-year renewal. You, you, we ask the visa, you will get a residency card, then you, you need to do a renewal after two years. On that renewal appointment, the foreign services will confirm at the end, what they will confirm is that all the requirements upon the application are still in force. So if any of the dependents at that time is no longer a dependent or has his own income, what we do is if it's um, a residency visa without being the golden visa is already working and living in Madara. So we can transfer him for a normal residency visa because he has stayed at least two years in the country. Right. If it's a golden visa, we can, as long as we confirm that he still resides in your address, and this is important, we can ask the renewal anyway until the fifth year. Okay. Please note that on the fifth year, you can apply for the permanent residency and on the sixth year for the citizenship. What they ask for the citizenship specifically is also, uh, of course, the evidence that you have lived in the country uh, for the for the for the residency visa. Uh, in fact, for the golden visa, the fourteen uh, days for the first year and seven days on the, on the, all the other years. 
but they will also they will also ask you to have the basic level for Portuguese. This is something that a lot of the clients also ask us. So the basic Portuguese, not being fluent or not being able to have a full conference in Portuguese, but the basic. And there are several schools here that do specific courses for that specific uh, purpose of the citizenship. Okay. Yes, we've got a question about that, actually, um, from Alexandra. To get citizenship after five years, does every family member need to learn Portuguese or is it just a visa holder? No, you will be, the citizenship is an individual file, so it will be analyzed individual. All of the members that are asking the, the citizenship, and please note, the applicant from the beginning is the the the, the grant the, the the first one who asked but with the family reunification all of the members have the same rights so all of them can ask the citizenship but all of them will have to fulfill the same duty to get the citizenship one of them is to have basic level of portuguese so yes they will ask to all the applicants at the basic level of portuguese Mm, okay, that's very interesting. Right. Um, we I'm now going to switch over to John. John, we've got a, a couple of questions more in your area. Um, we have uh, a question from. Um, ooh, where was it? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking for it. There we go. Um, from, this is from Matt. Uh, John, can you talk more about closing the fiscal record in the UK? In practical terms, what does that mean for tax benefits? Hmm. This is quite technical. It may get, it may have to go offline later. But um, can you talk more about closing the fiscal record in the UK? In practical terms, what does that mean for tax benefits like tax exemption on ISA and pensions? Well, there isn't any tax exemption on ISAs once you're resident in Portugal. They don't, they don't work. You'll have to uh, take the money out, ideally, before you leave the UK um, and then structure according to what's what's good for you in Portugal. Um, as far as pensions are concerned, uh, there is another question we can probably answer at the same time in the chat. This business of tax-free cash. It's not always in the client's interest to take tax-free cash, of course. And some people are worried about inheritance and the impacts there. Now, assuming the pensions legislation stays as it is, <laughs> and that's always a bit of a problem, um, that, then, it, then in fact, um, it could be beneficial to, to maintain the UK pension in the, in the form it is and not draw tax-free cash, but actually draw everything and just pay tax 10%. You could actually buy, take the tax-free cash before you leave. You could buy a per, what's called a purchase life annuity. And that in England is the, the, a lot of that money that you receive is regarded as return of capital, not income. And that's an interesting possibility. Um, there's then the, the thing that I'm researching at the moment is how, how do you give up your domicile? Mm. Because, um, okay, you're vulnerable for at least four years to pay inheritance tax in the UK because you're deemed domicile for that period. But if, in fact, we can get, a, get to a situation where you're no longer domicile and you've accepted a, a new domicile of choice, then, in fact, the UK are just not involved at all. And if you've retained no assets in the UK, how are you going to get taxed? Mm. Now, the best barrister I know on this who publishes a quite a useful eight-volume a textbook on this on the subject um i'm meeting with him when i'm over in london just to see if i can update my knowledge because how do we robustly give up our domicile not an easy thing it's just based on lots of confusing case law um but i do believe that that's a very interesting area to explore okay um, i should add uh, ladies and gentlemen our views that uh, both tanya and john will be with me in london uh, on the 20th of october you can see uh, our banner here, um, 20th of October uh, this year, so three weeks away, not even two weeks away today, and um, we will be at our Moving to Portugal show and seminars at the Pistana Chelsea Bridge Hotel all day on the Thursday the 20th. John and Tanya will both be with us in person and uh, come and talk to them. Look at movingtoportugal.org.uk 
for registrations and to come along. I've got one last question. We've got two or three more good questions, guys. So I think we'll keep going just for a little bit. John, this is another question for you. This is from Tariq. Uh, should you buy your residential property first and then apply for the D7 visa or the other way around? I, I think it depends on your personal circumstances. Um, I don't think it really matters. If, if in fact you're going to get the golden visa, no, you have the, golden to visa the golden visa, you will have to have expended the money. So you had to have, have, have put in half, the half million euros committed. Before you apply. Before you apply for the golden visa. But the D7, no, you, you don't, I don't okay. think it needs to be the way around. But you yeah. just need to be careful with the D7 to make sure that actually you're going to keep on qualifying as resident. Yes. We don't want yes. to lose that benefit. Uh, can I just take the, the opportunity to just to, to compliment? So um, we cannot apply for a visa if we don't have evidence of a fixed address. Okay. Of a fixed address. Yeah, exactly. But you, you must have, have an address in Portugal before you yeah, apply for a visa. Exactly. Exactly. Not, not the not the golden visa though. Well, the two of them, the two of them, okay? So if I'm applying for a D7 and I don't want to buy a real estate yet because I want to know the market, go there, live and see the best solution, I will have to do at least a rental agreement yeah. because I need to show evidence that I have a residential fixed address here. For the golden visa, Imagine that you're buying something that is in construction or that it's not ready yet, but you want already to uh, go ahead with the visa. In order for, for us to submit it, we will need to have at least evidence that you have a promissory agreement, that you already paid the minimum amount and that the promissory agreement is registered. Okay, even though you will receive the property in one year, six months, nine months. So formally, we need to see the technicality in order to submit. If we are not able to submit the file, um, we cannot apply for visa. Okay. 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 Um, Tanya, I've got one question for you here, which is interesting. Uh, if you prefer to reply separately to the gentleman, just let us know. But this is a question from Richard, who mm -hmm. asks, upon the initial residency application, I understand that there is the requirement to purchase personal health insurance. Yes. When is that required and for how long? And where is the best place to purchase it? Yeah, for any visa request, the state, the foreign services will ask you a health insurance. And why? They want to make sure that if something happens, you're covered. Okay, basically that's that's the question. We work with all the brokers in, in the insurance world in Portugal. So we can help you to get the health insurance. The, the, for the foreign services, they ask the basic health insurance. But I can tell you, for example, that several clients ask already a good health insurance besides the basic. So what we can do with you is we can ask several insurance companies, the basic and the conditions for uh, medium and high health insurance, and then you decide. I have to tell you that, and John can confirm this, that the health insurances in Portugal are a lot less expensive than in UK. So, um, with the coverage they give depends, of course, on the amount and the percentage of coverage you want. For the golden visa, for the other visas, they will ask a basic health insurance, which normally, according with my experience, of course, please note that this, this has a variety according with the age and any health problem, but the average for a couple um, in, in the mid-60s is about... 50 euros per month, okay? For the basic, uh, the, 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 the one usually used for the golden visa and all the other visas, but okay. we will help you with that. Okay, right, John, I've got a question from you, for you from uh, our guest Manoj, Manuj. Uh, if someone is making a passive income of 50,000 euros a month in his home country, and he has moved to Portugal under the D7 visa, and is also registered under the NHR, okay? 
So he's got an income of 50,000 euros a month outside Portugal, and he's living in Portugal under the D7 and the NHR. There is a double taxation treaty between his home country and Portugal. Where does he pay his taxes on his 50,000 euros income? Right. It'd be nice to know which country he's coming from, because not all tax treaties are the same. Um, no. But the but and, and where how many days he would be resident in Portugal. So let, let's, let's assume that he's resident for more than six months a year. Yes, because if he's under a D7, he has to be, doesn't he? Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Yeah. But to be a fiscal resident, and this is applicable to all visas except the golden visa, you need to reside in fact at least 183 yeah. days per year. Yeah. Okay? okay. So he's definitely resident in Portugal, John. He's resident in Portugal. Let's just, let's assume it's the UK because I'm more familiar with that because it, it, yeah. it could it could change. What's the source of that income? If that passive income is say dividends, let's, let's imagine that route. Yeah. Then in fact that's what's called disregarded income in the UK, so it can be paid out gross, and it's tax exempt in Portugal um, under under the under the, the visa. If that's rent from rental properties, then in fact the tax liability can follow the situs of the asset as far as the UK is concerned. So we need to just have a look at that and see yeah. if there is any credit. To see where, yeah. be able to, but in fact, the double treat treaty wouldn't give them, if say you had nil here and yeah. the tax paid there, you couldn't necessarily have a situation where you were uh, recovering tax okay. uh, necessarily. Um, it, it, it needs to be a bespoke answer. But, yeah. but, it, but yeah. essentially, you, you, that's, that's where you need the, the individual bespoke advice. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Tanya, I've got a question for you again from Manuj. Uh, under the D7 category, oh, we've just answered that. Under the D7 category, what is the minimum number of days a person yeah. needs to stay in Portugal? 183, okay. For any, any kind of any visa. visa. And similarly, the D2 entrepreneur visa. Yeah, we often think... We, we do all kinds of visa, including also labor visas, D2, digital normal. So yes, we do all the D2 also. Okay, fine. All right, and the last question we're going to ask today, um, I will ask, uh, well, both of you actually, um, one of our uh, listeners is saying, what are the key points? Actually, no, forgive me. Um, uh, <laughs> Is there a, no, that's a, excuse me, sorry, there's quite a lot of questions which demonstrate how complicated people find this whole thing. Um, let's say you want to move for less than six months to try out Portugal. Uh, John, how would you recommend somebody does that? They go to Portugal, spend 90 days, and if they wish to spend a bit more than that, they apply for a tourist visa? No. Or, no, what do you think, Tanya? What's your best recommendation? <laughs> If, sorry, John, I, I don't know, do you want to answer? So, uh, I'm just answering because we do have a lot of questions related to that. So, in order for you to come to Portugal, you need to apply for a tourism visa, okay? Yeah. A tourism visa is a visa that will give you 90 days in the country. You cannot apply for a second tourism visa straight away. You need to go out of the country and you cannot enter in the country in that semester, okay? But extraordinarily, if you want to check the country, see how it's going, and also because you're in the size, you can, before the 90 days are over, apply in the foreign services for an extension of the touristic visa. And the extension can be given until a maximum of 180 days. So instead of spending 90, you can spend 180. But please be aware that you need to ask the extension before the end of the timeline. We have had clients that only um, called us after the 90 days. And after the 90 days, you are forced to go. To okay. So just to recap, anybody who wants to go to Portugal and have a look around or normally goes to Portugal for let's say a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, that's fine. You can just get on the plane and go. They'll stamp your passport when you get there and they'll stamp your passport when you leave. 
If, however, uh, you already own a house in Portugal and from pre-Brexit and you live in the UK for tax purposes, but you want to get on a plane and go and spend five, six, seven, eight weeks in your lovely house on the beach, you get on the plane, have your passport stamped when you arrive, and after eight weeks, you could come back to the UK with no problem at all. But if you thought, actually, it's so lovely here, I want to stay here. I've had eight weeks nonstop in my lovely house in Portugal. I want to spend another month or two or three. Then you haven't applied for a touristic visa, have you? You, you need to go and regularise the fact that you're going to be there for 90 days and potentially a bit longer. So are you saying, Tanya, that... Anybody who intends to spend 90 days in Portugal non-stop should apply for a touristic visa before they go to Portugal. Yes. Okay. And if they change their mind while they're there, let's say they've been there three or four weeks and they want to stay for another 90 days or longer. They need to, they need to inform the foreign services before in they Portugal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there, there are several highlights. That's why before you start thinking on coming, you need to check. Imagine that you come for two months. You're within the tourism visa of the 90 days, which is granted to you when you arrive to the country. Because if you come for, for pleasure, they will give you automatically a tourism visa. Which so, is effectively the stamp in your passport. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but you're here for two months, you see a work possibility and you want to start. If Within the period of your permanence in the country, you establish some kind of contract with a Portuguese entity, you no longer need to apply for an extension or leave the country. What you can do is you go physically to the foreign services, and this is not done online. So this is done physically. You go physically to the foreign services in the area where you're saying, and you ask a it's called in Portugal uh, interest manifestation. So I physically want to say that I'm here in the country for tourism, but I have a labor agreement. I have a services agreement with a Portuguese entity. So I want to apply for or a labor visa or entrepreneur visa directly in Portugal. This is only possible if you establish a contract or written agreement with a Portuguese uh, entity. If you want to come to Portugal, but you're an entrepreneur or consultant and you have consulting with foreign entities, but you still want to live here, then we need to do a D2, but start in the country of origin. So as I told you, this seems complicated, but at the end, it's only a question of establishing which is your case and then we can guide you. Okay, wonderful. Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, again, we've ever run time, but some of these questions are so good. It's very clear our audience is fairly sophisticated and, and uh, well down the process, uh, or well into the process of moving to Portugal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Come and see us in London on the 20th of October, if you can. Otherwise, we'll do another event in central London in uh, March next year, but we will continue all our uh, online webinars Join on our database, just email us at info at portuguese-chamber.org.uk and we're looking forward very much to seeing you and make sure you move to Portugal, we can all recommend it. Thank you very much indeed to my guests Tanya and John and to my team here in the office, Carolina, thank you very much indeed. We look forward to seeing you all very soon. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye.